just wanted to now welcome everyone to um, my inspirational webinar, uh, the Global Talent Visa Endorsement Webinar in Digital Technologies. Now, I have two webinars that I run. This is the inspirational webinar where I interview a successful recipient and Hadil is our, um, our guest today. The second webinar which I run, and that's in two weeks time, that's the educational webinar. And it goes into more detail about the global talent, talent visa endorsement for um, digital technology. So if you just bear with me, I've got 10 slides that I'd love to share with you um, just to go through what is the global talent visa. And then um, we can kickstart um, our um, Q&A and our interview with Hadil. So today, um, as I said, I'll be talking about the, what is the global talent visa, um, the application and process, and then we'll go and interview Hadil and this is where you can also ask her all the questions that you're probably dying to ask and how she got it and what she did to become a successful recipient. And also I will um, provide you with an e-gift um, for coming to the webinar and taking an hour of your time today in the middle of the day to come to our webinar. So just a little bit about myself in case you, you don't know me or you've not met me before. I, just looking at the list and I've not met many of you, so um, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Michelle. Um, I'm from Australia and I'm Vietnamese by background. I'm the founder and CEO of Made With Glove. It's a UK wearable tech company designing heated gloves. Um, in 2016, I received the um, uh, Global Talent Visa and at that time it was called the Tier 1 Exceptional Talent Visa and I was endorsed with Exceptional Talent. Um, after I was endorsed, I became the Tech Nation Visa Ambassador and that's because at that time in 2016, it was such a new route to get into the UK or to stay in the UK, which was my case because I had an entrepreneur's visa, which was expiring and I didn't know what to do after that. So I applied for the um, Global Talent Visa and I got it. And I was one of probably the first 50 that received it. And because not many people knew about it, um, they asked me to be the ambassador and to talk to uh, lots of potential applicants. So I've been doing this for quite some time now, alongside my, my startup. Um, so the great thing about this uh, visa is that um, it allowed me to apply for an indefinite leave to remain. So it's similar to permanent residency after three years of being on this visa. And I got that last year. And then I was able to apply for and receive um, my British citizenship. Um, and it's, it's such an amazing journey that I've been on. Quite a stressful one because my um, visa immigration status was always up in the air. It was on my shoulders. And finally now, um, it's, it's the end of it. I've reached the end and I've got my citizenship. The next step is a um, British passport, but because of the way the world is, I can't apply for it just yet. So that's my next thing. And then, then I'll have um, dual citizenship, which is great. Um, I've been in the UK for about seven years, um, based myself in Manchester and Newcastle, and I went to London quite regularly, and, um, and that's how I met Hadil. So London, you know, as you know, it's a great place to, to live and work in the UK tech sector, but in the north, in Manchester and Newcastle, just as vibrant, it is a lot smaller, but the community there is just so supportive and um, and really great, and that's why I based myself up in the north. Um, before I became a tech entrepreneur in the UK, I was an Australian solicitor, um, and I lived in Perth, Western Australia, um, and worked um, as a solicitor for about eight years. Now, when I got my visa, I because I was it was such a new thing. Um, I started writing blogs about it, and really, the first blog I wrote about was my journey. Um, and because of that, so many people um, contacted me and asked me how I got it, and you know, obviously to help them. And that then uh, went into my Tech Nation Visa Ambassador role. So over the course of about you know three or four years, I've helped over 100 tech entrepreneurs, um, senior execs, and tech employees. And I started consulting in this area now, um, and you know the people that I, I help, uh, people working for WhatsApp, for Sony, um, Tata Communications. Um, I had a recent successful recipient um, worked at LinkedIn, 
Um, I work with startups, CTOs, CEOs, UX designers and graduates. So I've seen um, a lot of people um, throughout this process and my success rate is about 70 to 80 percent. So um, it, it's a good one, especially since the endorsement rate is about 50 to 60 percent. And that's because I've been through the process myself and I've helped a lot of people as well. And just a quick disclaimer, um, I only help in the stage one endorsements um, because there are two stages and the second stage is an immigration um, stage and that requires um, uh, help by a solicitor if you need it. I mean, you can go ahead and apply for that yourself. Um, I'm not affiliated with Tech Nation, even though I am an alumni, so that's that's another part of my role, but um, in terms of affiliated, I'm not affiliated with the Home Office or Tech Nation. So let's have a look. What is the Global Talent Visa? And hopefully you've read a little bit about it on the Tech Nation website. But if not, um, again, it was, it was the Tier 1 Exceptional Talent Visa. They've only just changed the name to Global Talent Visa um, this year in February. Um, and it's a special visa that was introduced by the UK government to allow highly skilled entrepreneurs and talent working in the field of digital technology the ability to apply for the right to live and work in the UK for up to five years. And the reason why it's up to five years is because if you're endorsed um, by Tech Nation in the first stage, then you can apply under exceptional talent or exceptional promise route. And the difference is the exceptional talent route is um, you get, after three years of living in the UK, you can apply for an indefinite leave to remain. And if you apply for the exceptional promise route, you um, can apply for indefinite leave to remain only after five years. So it's, it, the difference is three to five years. And the way you can get this endorsement is you, you must meet the strict criteria set by Tech Nation before you can apply for the visa. Okay. And, it, and if you've looked at the guidelines, it looks like it's a job application because you need to supply your CV and a personal statement and reference letters. But when you, when you delve into the criteria, and I'll go through that quickly today, it's more than a job application, okay? Because you need to show evidence that you're advancing the digital tech sector, either in the UK or in your own digital tech sector from where you're from. Now, if you Google or search hashtag Tech Nation Visa, it will take you to um, the Global Talent Visa in Digital Technology. The Global Talent Visa is actually an umbrella visa and Tech Nation or the Tech Nation Visa is, is like a spoke under one under the umbrella. There are other endorsing bodies such as um, the Royal College of um, Engineering and Science, there's the Arts Council and there's also the UKRI which is a research institute. Now they are all endorsing bodies as well but Tech Nation is one of them and they only endorse applicants for the Digital Tech Visa. Now, the benefits of the actual Global Talent Visa, and that includes the Tech Nation Visa and all the other ones that, apply, that go under the Global Talent Visa, is you've got the freedom and the flexibility to live and work in the UK for up to five years. You can apply for an indefinite leave to remain in British citizenship. You can also bring your dependents with you. So you've got a partner um, and your children as well, so they can come under your visa. You can also register a UK limited company. This is quite important because I know that when I work with some students on the tier four visa, they can't apply for, um, um, well, they can't register um, a UK company. So this visa will allow them to do that. Um, you can also work for a tech company without the need for a company sponsorship. And this is the most important thing, I think, that, and that this is why a lot of people like this visa. Company sponsorships are expensive and they take ages as well. Um, so if you've got this visa, you're free to work anywhere you want to um, without you know, asking the company to sponsor you. And that is why the visa is attached to you. And another great thing is that this visa is, is very cost effective and I'll go through how much it will cost. But um, just, you know, I've, I've had the entrepreneur's visa um, that cost, you know, that was a few thousand. Um, and the ILR, the indefinite leave to remain, that was a few thousand. And then the British citizenship, that's another few thousand. So this particular one, it, it's in the hundreds. So it's not, not as, as bad as um, the others. So it, it is quite cost effective. Now the stats, just quickly going through, a lot of people are, um, who apply are from the US, that's I think there's, there's I think it's about 
percent um, are from the US. Um, and another lot is about is from India. So those are the two main countries that um, the applicants come from. Nigeria is coming up um, as you know, a lot of people applying from there, um, Canada and Russia. Um, and these are just the stats. Obviously, I'm Australian, so obviously I applied. And there's only a, you know a, under 10% of us, but you know it's just giving you the stats of the, the amount of applicants that apply from these countries. As I said, it's a 50 to 60% endorsement rate. Um, when I applied, it was around 68%, and I think that's because not many people knew about it. But now, with with um, ambassadors and you know with Tech Nation and advertising and promoting it a lot more, um, the endorsement rate is higher which is good news, but still, uh, sorry, is a lot lower. So, um, you know, one, one in two applicants are unsuccessful, which, which is unfortunate, but the good news is you can either appeal and reapply. So it's not the end of your journey there. Um, over the last, I think it was um, um, introduced in 2014. So since 2014, there've been just over 1,000 successful recipients and it doesn't sound a lot, and I know that. And um, we've been really trying hard to push them to increase that. And that is because when I applied, and only just um, this year, there was a cap of 200 applicants um, that were allowed to be endorsed per year. And they opened that in two stages, in April and October. They used to only allow 100 in April and 100 in October get in. But now since um, the Global Talent Visa has, has had a refresh, um, there are more endorsements available. So whoever, can, whoever applies has the opportunity to be endorsed so long as they fit the criteria. So there is no longer a cap, so that's really good news. And then you can see in the stats in 2017, um, there were 450 applications submitted but not everyone obviously um, were successful. So around, you know, the 50, 60% endorsement rate. So they did make that cap for 200. Um, and then in 2018, 19, there were 650 applications. Um, so about half of that got through. And even though it is more than the 200, they were allowed to um, endorse people um, over the 200. They, they just grabbed a, a pot of um, extra endorsements they were allowed but that was capped as well at that time. And now, um, so far, there's been about 950 plus applications um, this year. So as you can see, the numbers are increasing. Um, it's a good thing, but then there's, high, there's more competition as well. So um, it, I just wanted to share these stats with you just so you can see. Now let's delve into the eligibility criteria because that's really important. It is a tech visa. But the good news is you don't just need hardcore tech skills. Um, I, I don't have hardcore tech skills. I didn't go under the, the technical skills. You can apply under technical skills or business skills. So as you can see, they've listed um, examples of jobs that um, you may have and you can, if, if you fit under that, then definitely apply. But if you don't, don't be disheartened because the tech sector moves so quickly Tech Nation don't know every single job that's out there. This is just to give you an idea of what types of jobs um, that would fit the eligibility criteria. But if you don't, just have a look at it and see which one you fit in or the closest to and sort of um, apply using that. So don't worry too much. Now, what's not um, eligible, um, this is something that they've only just introduced in the last few years because they're very clear on who should not really apply or who, should, who aren't eligible and on, on the right. What I've seen um, in the last couple of years of doing this is Tech Nation have rejected or not accepted people who work in consultancy roles. And that's because they want you to work for companies that are product led. They don't want you to work for clients, they want you to work with them. So anyone that's producing any products, any digital tech products, and it doesn't have to be hardware, it can be software as well. So that's, that's something that's really um, important. And when you read the criteria, it will say product led digital technology company. And that's the main thing that, that you need to take into consideration. Now, the documents that you would need to submit, all in its 15 documents. And as you can see, it does look like a job application. You've got to submit a CV, a personal statement, and you've got to pick 
um, experts in your field and you need to provide three letters of, of recommendation by these experts. And all these three kinds of documents are a must. Now, the second part is there's key and qualifying criteria which um, Tech Nation um, ask you to select from. So they've listed um, a whole list of criteria. You don't have to select all of them. You only need to select some that apply to you or that you have evidence for. So let's have a look. As I mentioned, you can apply under exceptional talent or promise. And the way you can decide this is people who have exceptional talent, and I know this, is, this one is a mind frame as well. No one ever thinks that they are exceptionally talented. I mean, I went through the same process. It's, it's just a way of them deciding which one you can go under. And people with exceptional talent should have more than five years experience in the digital tech sector. People who apply under exceptional promise will have less than five years. And that is um, just a rough guide indication. If you're like on the cusp, so if you've got like three or three to four years or you know, like four, four or five years, I would probably apply under promise just because the benchmark um, and the amount of evidence you have to provide is, is not as tough as the exceptional talent route. Now, so as I said, there's two criteria. There's the key and mandatory criteria, and then there's the qualifying criteria. So under the key criteria, there's two there, and you select one out of two. You don't have to select both. You can if you want to, but then that just means you've got less evidence to provide and fulfill that criteria. The first criteria is about innovation. So you should be doing something in the form of innovative digital tech work. And um, this one is quite hard because people do ask me, you know, what, what documents show innovation? And if you're developing a product, um, it's quite easy in terms of you show your designs, you show your prototypes, um, and you show your concepts. And that's in the technical side. Um, if you're in, under a business skill, um, what I advise my clients is strategy because strategy can be quite innovative as well. So those are the two types of things, business and technical skills. Um, I do know that Tech Nation have said that you can provide proof in the form of in employment contracts. Um, that really doesn't show innovation. Um, so innovation is about your work. And if you, can't, if you don't have it already, you can, you can create it to show what is the innovation and why is it innovative? And it's up to you to convince that they've left it for you to, do, to, to show um, the innovation. The second criteria that you can select under key criteria is proof of recognition outside of your immediate occupation. So this is stuff that you do that's outside of your job and outside of the job that you get paid to do. So it's really, what do you do um, volunteer wise maybe to advance the digital tech sector? because this is about um, improving the UK tech sector um, once you get here or if you, if you choose to stay here. So this is one thing that I, I selected this second one. Now over to the qualifying criteria, there's four different qualifying criteria that you can select and you only need to select two. Um, the first one is you need to show the, your impact. So the impact of your work and um, it can be an entrepreneurial, uh, technical or entrepreneur, uh, commercial impact of your work. And this is very different to innovation over in the key criteria. So impact means metrics. So if it wasn't for you, um, where would this project be? Where would this product be? So you need to show that. The second one, because this is an exceptional talent type visa, you need to show that you're a leader or you're, you're a potential leader in the field of digital tech. Okay, so those things like thought leadership type things. So maybe if you've spoken at an event about the industry, if you've written articles and blogs about, you know, your field of expertise. The third qualifying criteria is about continuous learning. And this is one of the easiest ones to um, meet because it's about certifications. So if you've um, reached a certain level in your career and you've done courses um, to improve your skills or upskill, certificates are the perfect way to show that. So um, a lot of people do meet this criteria because it's a matter of showing the certificates, but you need to show the certificates um, that you've spent um, completing the course that's more than 20 hours. Um, when I applied in 2016, this continuous learning was very um, relaxed. So people were just 
submitting certificates and doing Google courses and Coursera courses that were like, you know, one or two hours and they submitted it and then they met the criteria. But Technation have now gone, okay, um, we won't accept those courses. We want you over a span of five years um, and we want, you know, a couple of certificates to prove that you meet this criteria and you need to have done courses that are more than 20 hours. And the final one is academic contributions. And this is the type of thing that um, if you're building a product or if you're working on a project and that you've um, impacted or um, worked with a university and you've made academic contributions to their research. And this is something that I um, applied under and I um, provided a letter of support from a professor um, because I was developing a product and I assisted them in their research and they helped me as well. So um, I used that criteria. So I know it's a lot, but just remember over on the key criteria, there's two, but you only need to select one. And then on the qualifying criteria, you only need to select two out of the four. And all of them make up your 10 documents. So each criteria, I would probably submit three documents per criteria. And then the last one, the fourth one, you can pick whichever criteria that you, you feel that you've got another document to submit. Now, the process, as I said, it's a two-stage process. Um, so the first stage is just the endorsement stage, and that's all your documents. And what you would do is you pay and register online at the Home Office. And as I said, it's very cost effective. So it's only £456. And that's just for the endorsement stage. That's the endorsement stage where you submit your documents and you let Tech Nation um, review your documents. And then they have eight weeks in which to say, yes, you are endorsed with exceptional talent or exceptional promise. And that's when they say, yes, you are successful or no, you're unsuccessful. And they've got eight weeks in which to do this. They can take a shorter amount of time and which we'll go through. And Hedil is a perfect example of a very quick turnaround, but they usually say it takes eight weeks. And this is that the technician assessors will assess this. Technician assessors are experts in the tech sector as well. So if you are successful, the next stage, and that's stage two, this is the home office visa stage. This is when you say, okay, I'm applying for my visa now. And that's only 152 pounds. That's really cheap. Um, and this is the process that um, Hadil is going through now. So um, you need to submit all your, um, your, your letter, your endorsement letter and your passport and any other documents that they need. And you um, then apply, um, I think biometrics as well. And this is where you pay your um, immigration health surcharge. And that one is more expensive than 152 pounds. Um, at the moment, it's 400 per year. So if you've got a five year visa, that's 400 times five, that's 2000, you have to pay that upfront. And that takes about three to eight weeks. When I applied, luckily it was only 200 per year. They've increased it to 400 per year. This is the immigration health surcharge. And in October, they're increasing it to 624 per year. So if you are looking at applying um, and you're nearly ready, apply pretty soon because in October, they're going to increase it another 224 pounds per year. And that's for your dependents as well, if you're bringing them over. Okay, so that's if you're successful. If you're unsuccessful, you can appeal, um, which is a great news. And also the appeal doesn't cost you any money. It just costs you time in which to do it. You've got 28 calendar days in which to appeal the unsuccessful result. And you need to um, show that the assessor made a mistake. Not that you, know, you don't like the decision and, and you know, 100% of applicants who are unsuccessful don't like the decision, but you need to prove that the documents that you've presented do meet the criteria and that um, you believe that the assessor made the mistake and you need to show why they made that mistake. So you've got 28 days in which to do that. And then you submit again, you don't pay a fee. And then this um, Tech Nation will take 28 days in which to come back to you and either you're successful or unsuccessful in the appeal. If you're successful, great, you go to stage two. If you're unsuccessful, you can go through the same process again and work on your documents, take on the feedback and resubmit, or you've got other visa routes. Okay, I think that's it. I hope um, that um, gives you enough of a quick rundown. Um, and if you've got any questions, please ask, but I want to um, share with you that the e-gift 
is my uh, UK Global Talent Visa Endorsement eBook. So I've created this book. Uh, it's about 28 or 30 pages, um, going through a few of the, the criteria and things to to um, watch out for questions. Have you done this? Have you done that? It's just you know me nagging on your shoulders uh, to ask you if you've fulfilled this criteria and what you need to make sure um, you, you, you check off your list to um, present a strong application. Um, I didn't have any of this when I started. Um, and uh, you know, three, four years later, I've learned so much in the process, not only from my own application, but helping others and going through the appeals with them. And um, yeah, it's, it's something that uh, I'd like to share with you so that you can have uh, and take on board with you. Uh, as I said, I've been doing this for a few years and um, I'm actually going to be launching a UK Global Talent Visa Facebook group. Um, so I will let you know how to join it if you'd like to join. Um, and I'll send that uh, all the details in the, um, in the newsletter, which I'll hopefully send today um, or tomorrow. So let's have a look at um, the next stage of the process. And we are going to invite Hadil. Hadil is a very good friend of mine um, and a successful recipient. Um, of the uh, Global Talent Visa. She's um, in the process of um, getting her visa now. So she's just been endorsed with exceptional talent, which means that in three years time, Hadil can apply for the indefinite leave to remain. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing screen and I'm going to invite Hadil to share her, her camera. And then, um, perfect, great, we've got, We've got lots of people here now. So if anyone, okay, so I'm just gonna go quickly go through the, um, any questions first, if anyone has any questions and then I can't see any questions. But feel free to ask any questions because now we're gonna go over to Hadil and, and welcome Hadil. Thank Hello. you. Um, okay, so let's, let's ask Hadil what, what's your background and give us uh, a little bit of a story about your story. Okay, so um, I'm Saudi, I'm Saudi Arabia, and like a lot of my, um, a lot of people from my home country, we have a scholarship program that sends us abroad to get higher education. And so you'll find a lot of Saudis here in the UK who came to do a master's degree or a PhD degree. And myself, I've been here for seven years already, but uh, because I was doing a PhD that was practice-based, most of my research happened within the industry so I worked with a lot of local authorities and eventually my work became uh, fundamental in some of the uh, local schools and I felt like that my work has just started and I started making a difference and I wasn't yet ready to go back home and so I started looking at different routes that allows me to stay to uh, make that experience for me um, you know, um, a holistic one where I don't just start the work and leave, I finish it. And so that I can actually, when I decide to do something else, that this is up and running all by itself and that the contribution I made is not just ended because my research degree has ended. I still wanted to see that work continue. And so uh, that was one of the reasons I was looking at different visa routes to allow me to do that, um, you know, in a way that also gives me a better future opportunity um, to create something else if I, if, I, if I wanted to. Yeah, so you've got a research background. Yes. PhD turned tech entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And how did you, like, so what visa were you on? On, on your I was on a student visa student visa yeah. yeah okay so then how did you know about this route because I know that was coming to an end um how did you know about this route and then what made you apply um was it because your visa was expiring because a lot of people do um yeah so, um I I didn't know about this route at all at the time when I was looking at options I, I found the innovators visa the entrepreneurs visa the graduate visa and I didn't fit any of those a startup visa was kind of where I fitted, but I applied and got denied. So I was started to think about, okay, maybe this is, you know, that's it. I, I just, I might have to get a job or something. And I started looking at jobs. Oh, but then 
I met you. <laughs> right. so they were able to technology show together and then had a little bit of time afterwards. So we went for a drink. And during that time, I told you, I think you asked me, what do I plan to do? Yeah. And I'd like to stay, but I don't know what else to do. You know, I, I can't find any option. And he told me about this and I didn't think it was real. <laughs> Cause I thought how, you know, I did a lot of research and it just didn't pop on any of my um, That's crazy. research. Yeah. Not even on, on like the university website, which normally the immigration yeah. is where the first thing students go to. So you told me about the global talent visa at the time. It was a special exceptional, exceptional talent, talent visa. Yeah. Visa. And I went home and I looked at the requirements and it was just so overwhelming mm. uh, looking at it and reading through all of it. You know, I stayed all night doing that and I woke up with the idea of there is no way I can do this. This is a lot of work. It's like another PhD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does seem like a PhD. <laughs> yeah, it just felt so overwhelming. And it's because it's not just myself. I have to reach out to some people to write pieces of evidence for me. I'm very shy and I really don't like to ask people to do things or ask for favors at all. And I felt a little bit hesitant. And that was three years ago. So what I decided is to wait until the end of my PhD degree, closer to the end. And during that time, because I had three years, I created a folder on my computer. And so whenever I met someone that I felt could be a potential, you know, um, support uh, to ask them for a letter, I just kept that, you know, in the document saying, I could ask this guy, I could ask this woman and stuff like that. <laughs> and so I started creating a network very slowly. Whenever I was invited to give a talk or whenever I was invited to run a workshop, I said yes to everything. In my head, I was building a portfolio so that at the end of the three years, when my visa expires, I can look back and say, I did this, I did that. And I can also talk to the people who run the workshop and say, I've been doing this with you guys for two years. Can you please write a letter for me? Yeah. I, I can do that if I plan ahead. And I feel like I still didn't really decide to go ahead with it until the lockdown because my visa had only a month <laughs> left on it. Oh my gosh. Uh, I can't, I, I can't I judge because I had like two months left on my visa yeah. and I was like, uh Oh, <laughs> I might get deported. <laughs> yes. yes. I only had a month left and uh, I had an option to extend my student visa or finally to start thinking about the global talent visa and because of the lockdown and I had nothing else to do you know I was wrapping up my PhD my job wasn't happening we were all yeah. sitting at home and I know what really made me like make the decision to apply it was when I got an email from immigration saying they're allowing people to switch visas from inside the UK whereas before they'd had to go home and apply from home because of the COVID-19 and I felt okay <laughs> Because that means I don't have to go home and apply from home and stay up to eight weeks there. I yeah. could just switch visas from inside the UK. And that's what really made me decide to just sit down, dedicate three or four days to go through the entire application process, send emails to the people and explain to them that this is why I'm applying now, if they can really help me. And telling them I have one month left on my visa. <laughs> so that's an urgency. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of these people I develop personal relationships with in terms of, I, you know, we, we do social events, we do not just work things. And so I had the courage to say, guys, this is a personal thing, but can you please help me? Whereas three years ago, I didn't have that, those connections, I didn't have those relationships, I didn't have any work experience. Yeah. With them. And so I felt like that was the right time. Okay. I put it together so, a few days. Early. I know, it's amazing. Like, okay. I don't, I don't encourage anyone to do it in three days, but mm -hmm. Hedil, you've been gathering documents for years. Yeah. So, so it's not like you, you, you did it in three days, like one whole sitting, it was a gradual thing. So I don't, I don't encourage anyone to do that. And even then Hedil, you said it was so stressful. Um, but I do have a question from Aziz and he's asking, um, can you share with us the documents you submitted, especially those related to those who are working in the research field? Because yeah, you, your your background in is is in research. Did you submit any documents? So, um, I had to choose between um, applying as a significant contribution in the research field or applying as a significant contribution in the tech field. And although I fit both criteria, mm. I had more evidence and stronger evidence in the tech field. Ah. In the research field, to to apply as a significant contributor, you have to have published a lot of research papers 
and I didn't publish much. Mm. But in the tech field, I had a patent mm. and I had a tech startup that raised inv investment and created jobs. Uh, and I had workshops that I ran, tech workshops that I ran at universities. And I felt like this was a stronger contribution and I had a lot of evidence there. Whereas as a researcher, I think a lot of uh, research contributors um, choose to show their track record of published work. publication. Yes, I didn't correct. have that. Yes. And so that's why I didn't uh, include any of my uh, research. Yeah. You make a good point because, um, yes, Aziz, that's a really good question. Um, I just helped a client and he had a research background. He had about 10 or 15 publications and his problem was he had too many. <laughs> so we had to pick which ones were um, not only research, but research in the digital tech field, right? Because it, this is a digital tech visa. So, yes, that qualifying criteria for... Um, is a contributions in academic research and you would put published papers um, and you would present that. Now, you can only have two um, pages. So you would probably put your, your front page, which is the title, your, um, it's got your name, the author and the abstract, and then maybe some, a second page of something, I don't know, um, but something to show your name and what it is. Um, I also had a question, um, age i get this all the time does it matter how old you are yeah what do you think hadil <laughs> um, i never thought of it that never no. crossed my mind i didn't see it in the criteria and so i never actually thought that age would be an issue and for someone to show track record of a significant contribution it is expected for them <laughs> to be you know in their 30s or yes. more yes um and so i never thought that my age would be an issue yeah, I agree. And um, I, yeah, it, this is more about your skills and your qualifications. And if you are an exceptionally talented person, um, more than five years, I mean, I've got applicants with 10 years, 15 years experience, I never ask them their age. And also that would be age discrimination um, as well. So I think age actually works to your advantage in this case. <laughs> yeah. um, the only one that has been rejected because of age and, and not they weren't rejected because of their age. They were rejected because of their lack of experience and they were only like 18 or 19. And I remember this was years ago when I was doing the ambassadorial role, I had a father contact me and say his son was rejected. And when I saw his credentials, I was like, gosh, he's really young. Like I didn't even need to look at his age. The fact that his father contacted me was one. And, and the second thing was I looked at his application and he didn't even have what, you would expect someone um, with a potential exceptional talent, like exceptional promise to have. So age is definitely not a thing. It's more about experience. Um, Bilal, were there any supplementary documents you submitted in addition to the ones required? And was your PhD research related to digital tech or did you make a switch? Yes, so my PhD is in uh, technology innovation. That is my thesis. And so I did include in my personal statement uh, a little bit about my research. Uh, I, I spoke about what field I was, uh, you know, researching and what kind of uh, studies I was doing with the local community. And so um, I also included in the evidence, not in the supporting letter, a letter from my supervisor saying that he's a director of research in digital technology and that my research has a great contribution to the tech sector in the UK, not just the research field. So I kind of tried to connect all of those together to show that, yes, I'm a researcher, but I've got contribution in the digital tech yeah. um, um, area and that I have someone from digital tech to confirm that, but also have someone from the research um, angle as well to say that I've got a contribution. The other thing in the supplementary document, I... I submitted a patent, a copy of my patent application to show under the, I think that was under the contribution, the significant contribution. I chose to submit um, my patent application um, because that speaks to an original contribution to the innovation field. And I also included the title of that in my personal statement saying that my research led to the development of a piece of technology that I was able to 
uh, register a patent for, um, to give them a holistic, you know, a feel of how my work is contributing to the digital tech sector. Yeah, um, definitely. I think the main gist is, and I speak to every applicant, always um, make it relevant to digital tech. If it's not relevant to digital tech, it's it's not relevant. Like it's that's what the assessors are looking for. This is a digital tech visa. Um, okay, there's a question. How did you manage to get a decision with UK VCAS centres being closed if you submitted the application during COVID-19? Okay, so Mohammed, this is a, um, so it's a two stage process. So the first stage is the endorsement stage and the endorsement um, tech nation assessors will assess the application. So it's got nothing to do with your um, visa. So if your visa is expiring, um, you submitting the endorsement doesn't stop it from ticking along. It's only once you get the endorsement, then you apply to UK VCAS. That's the stage two visa application. And that's when it's a proper visa application. So um, that's why Hadil received her, um, the answer from Tech Nation during COVID. I mean, it's, it's an online thing. And then now she's now she's trying to apply and and uh, get in touch with UK VCAS and and hopefully get into an office and show her passport and all those you know, fingerprints and and things like that. Now we we have to mention that her deals, even though she spent what three days with the application you submitted, when did they come back to you? Because they do have up to eight weeks. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I submitted on a Sunday, and got the endorsement back on Wednesday. So that was what three or four days. That's quick. Um, that That's was amazing. Quick. Yeah, and I, I didn't know that that was the endorsement letter. I thought it was a notification <laughs> that they had received <laughs> the application from Technician. Wow. I did not realize that was the endorsement letter until I shared it with the immigration officer at university, and he's like, oh. "When are you applying? Your visa is expiring." I'm like, "I got a notification from the home office, <laughs> uh, but I don't know what's going on." And he's like, "That's your endorsement." <laughs> I didn't expect it to come back within the week, honestly. That's crazy. I've never heard of that, but um, we, we discussed this and it's definitely COVID because yeah. I've helped a lot of applicants during COVID in the last sort of two months. And, you know, your story was the first, but now I've, I'm getting applicants, my clients are all getting like notified within probably three weeks maximum, three weeks the longest now, as opposed to it was eight weeks. Yeah. Um, there is a fast track option. Um, I got through on the fast track, um, but that was because that option was available then. Now, the only way you can fast track is if you've been accepted into an accelerator program. And these are usually for tech entrepreneurs. And that's because accelerator programs by its very nature is a very quick, fast moving thing. Um, programs are like usually three months long. And you know, if you get accepted, things happen very quickly. And that's why they appreciate that anyone who is an accelerator needs to be fast tracked. The fast track is I think um, 18 working days or something like that, but it's still you know, a good few weeks. Um, but because of accelerators, they're probably not you know, um, happening at the moment you probably don't need to fast track. And even then, Hadil's application was uh, accepted before the 18 day fast track anyway. So I, I wouldn't, yeah, it doesn't really matter yeah. if it's fast tracked or not. Um, now, experts, how did you decide who your experts were? Because we need to submit three letters from three different experts from three different companies, um, you know, during the COVID-19 lockdown, but maybe that worked in your favor because everyone's at home. Um, you said you had five experts. Yes, so what I did is I emailed five experts because I didn't know who's gonna reply to me in time um, before my visa expired. And so uh, one of them was one of the awards I received and it was a significant award from booking.com. And the really difficult thing was they wanted it to be signed by a senior position. And so to get someone senior in booking.com to, you know, to write a letter for me, wasn't the easiest thing in the world, but I had a very good connection with their uh, PR office because we did a lot of uh, media coverage together. And I said, guys, this is what I need. You can really help me with this. It's important. And so they managed to get the CEO of booking.com to sign off on it just because she was the one who handed me the award the first year and asked me to come back as a keynote speaker the following year. So she kind of knows me mm -hmm. and that really worked in my favor. 
And because the award was specifically for leaders in digital tech, she was able to speak about that in her letter of support, saying that I am a recognized leader. They looked at different applications and they, you know, uh, felt like my contribution was significant. And so that was important, not just to have her as a recommender, but also to, to cover why am I a tech leader? Why are they recognizing me and supporting me? And they were very happy that I, I, I got back to them and told them that I got endorsed and they shared that again in their media network. Oh, so, fantastic. So what really does go in like a full 360 loop and that's really what something I, I, I felt here in the UK. My yeah. second expert was the, um, the, um, the CEO of the Accelerator that I joined. The Accelerator I was part of is not listed on Tech Nation's list of um, yeah, sorry, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, tracks. yeah, I forgot to mention. There's a list. Yeah, yeah there's a list. but apparently, accelerators are important all the same, even though they're not on the list. And so, I reached out to the CEO of my accelerator. Again, he was the managing director. I know him personally, and they also asked me to come back and speak at many of their events. And so, I have that level of connection with them to say, "You've asked me to come and speak at different events. I always came every time. I never said no. I never asked for a fee. I did it for free." This is the time for me. <laughs> Payback. <laughs> yeah, and I did all of these engagements thinking ahead of when I need them, they'll give me that letter. Mm. And indeed, he sent it back within the week, like two or three days it was mm. back. And he's like, just tell me what's the criteria. And that was something I did. I copied the what Tech Nation had on their website saying that your letter support should include one, two, three. I copied it and pasted it when I asked my recommenders for letters and said, your letter needs to tick all of these boxes. Mm -hmm. I included the information about me for them to include in their letters because they probably don't know everything about me yeah. or maybe don't remember all of it. So I kind of helped them or refresh their memories and they included that in the letters with their own recommendation, which I wanted it to be genuine. Yeah. Uh, my third expert that I chose was someone who I worked with in with local authorities to introduce my technology into the classrooms. And so even though she wasn't maybe a significant um, expert in the field, she was an expert in my technology because her school used 50 different technology in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And she was able to put that in, in writing, in perspective, and to say that my technology was you know, really helpful in the classroom yeah. that the school ordered um, a lot of equipment for me as well and that they worked closely with me and they included me in their documentary. So she kind of gave a light from that humanitarian perspective yeah. that puts my work in the field and gives them that kind of evaluation. Yeah, because that's interesting because it's not, and I, talk, I tell all my clients this, it's not just your work. It's, it's how does your work fare against others um, that puts you at, that level that you know leadership that you're innovative um so that you can convince the assess because the assessors don't know every single piece of technology out there they're relying on your experts knowledge and expertise and what they've seen in their particular field of expertise what makes you so special i know you are very special but this is <laughs> you know the, that's what the assessors are looking for is what makes you so special against everyone else that's probably doing the same thing um, so that they can confidently say, yes, she has an exceptional talent. Um, I have a question about, um, as is you're working on computing applied to the construction centre and digitising the industry, would that make me eligible? Yes, it depends what type of thing um, that you're working on, but com construction and digitising that industry, I worked in that area when I was working at the university in Newcastle. Um, it, it's It's construction is a very traditional sector. So you are in the perfect place to say, uh, yeah, that, that sector needs, needs a digital transformation. Um, but we can have a chat later on about it um, separately. But yes, it looks, yeah, um, I would say yes. Um, and Samuel was saying that he's not into tech, but he wanted to ask about other fees that I mentioned after obtaining the visa. Is it applicable to everyone entering in the UK? Yes. So biometrics. Yes, I've had I, I've had to do so many biometrics, like my fingerprints everywhere. <laughs> um, and that fee was nineteen twenty. 
19, yeah. so not nine, 1,920, but it's 19 pounds 20. <laughs> um, so that's one fee. Then it's the immigration health surcharge fee. Um, that's with all, well, I don't know, but I've had to pay the immigration health surcharge fee. I think when I had got my entrepreneur's visa, did you have to pay for your student visa? Yes, always. Yeah. And then I had to pay for it for the global talent or the exceptional talent. But when I went for my indefinite leave to remain, I didn't have to pay the um, immigration health surcharge. So that was a huge relief. Um, but even then, my, my indefinite leave to remain was like 3,000. So that was quite a lot anyway. So, yeah, if I had to put in another, you know, few grand, um, that would have, yeah, that would have been just too much. So, yeah, I think most of the visas, I don't know. I only know from my own experience and Hadil, she's saying, yes, yeah, so you have to pay the um, immigration health surcharge fee. Oh gosh, there's loads of questions before we finish. We've got three minutes, sorry. Um, Hadil's application surely was very strong. I've never heard of an endorsement being received in just one week or ever before. Yeah, neither have I. So <laughs> that's why COVID lockdown, everyone's off. People have time to do it. So um, yes, I had a client just yesterday email me and she said she, she said she got her, she submitted and then I think in four days, she got a response saying yes, but, and this is what happened to me as well, it went to her spam, her junk. So she let it sit there for five days and she emailed me this mor yesterday morning saying, oh my gosh, Michelle, I got the endorsement, but it'd been sitting in my junk for five days and it would have only taken four days. So yes. Um, okay, what was the most frustrating aspect of the application process for both of you? <laughs> Time. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the length and depth of the information they require in very limited articles. So I don't, it was very difficult for me to just submit 10 pieces of evidence. There's so much more stuff and I couldn't decide which was more important. And then at the end of the day, you just have to pick the best 10 that represent your case. Yeah. And put as much of information as you can in, in those 10 articles. Yeah, there's a lot of rejigging and formatting. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be of quality as well. Yeah. Like every yeah. line counts. Yeah. Um, there's two yeah. questions about the list of evidence. I don't know how we're going to cover all that. That's okay. I'll I'll go back and and yeah. I'll, very I'll, quickly, I'll, yeah. my, my documents was basically for each qualifying criteria to show that I'm a leader. I showed my judging invitations um, and my awards. To show that I have a significant contribution, I put my patent, my company's house registration for my company and also the brochure of my uh, technology that it's trading and it's, you know, what kind of impact it's, it's making in the community. Um, so those were like my most documents for tech stuff to show that um, I've done a significant contribution as well. I did put a little bit of my patented information, which was my code, my hardware design, my software design and all of that, because I know there are experts in there and they will uh, identify the contribution if they read it. And so that's why I included that, even though it was protected. Um, I did put my uh, agreements with the schools to introduce my technology into the classrooms because I felt that was also, uh, it showed the contribution. Um, and um, a little bit of information about my investment and how I created jobs and how I had workshops and mentorship programs to show that I am, me being here means that I also affect other people getting jobs or getting mentored or um, uh, giving my knowledge and sharing it through workshops. Yep, does that help? <laughs> um, and I know you've got a question about regulatory technology. I'm going to have to have a chat with you after if that's okay. Um, it might, yeah, we don't, we don't have much time left, but I'll, I'll, I'd like to have a, a chat with you. What I do after these webinars is on Mondays, I, um, I do office hours. So I'll mention that in my newsletter and we'll have a chat. So, um, yeah. Samuel, asking about applying from outside the UK, personal statement, how to get letters of recommendation. Um, you can get letters of recommendation by experts from outside of the UK as well. They don't have to be in the UK and they, have, they should really be people that you know. You can't just pick a random person to ask them to write your, your letter because you need to say how you know them. Um, and I can talk you through that as well um, separately. Um, yes, yeah, so as is quickly, shall I comment on the documents, for example, learning certificates and how I implement what I've learned into practice? Um, it should already state that because um, the continuous learning should be about, okay, where are you now? 
and what did you do to get to where you are and how, um, your ex how you've got that experience. Um, your certificate should show that it should kind of be in the same field. If it needs context, absolutely put context in. And this is what we were talking about is rejigging and restructuring and formatting your documents to squeeze it into two pages and to put as much information as you possibly can in those two pages. But we can have a chat as well after about it. Um, so before I finish up, if I haven't answered all the questions, I will pick it up after and talk to you guys separately. Hadil, the last question is, what advice do you have for people um, looking back at the stress because it is the, the biggest frustration is time the stress relying on experts and just being out of time in case your visa runs out for me that was my biggest one but Hadil your advice please when you're looking back aside from all the stress <laughs> how would you do it differently if you were to reapply definitely ask for help because going through all of this on my own made me doubt every you know, a uh, step of the way, if this was the right document, did I say the right thing? And another set of eyes really, really would have helped. And um, yeah, it would, it would have just gave me the confirmation I needed and also fixed the things that I didn't pick up on because I'm so into the process. You really yeah. lose touch with the bigger picture. So yeah, getting help, asking for advice, and also knowing that you're not alone. There's other people doing that with you as well. Uh, I only didn't reach out for help because I decided on the spot that I wanted to do that now. I stayed up all night, three nights in a row, got it done and submitted. And I didn't want to drag anyone with me in that process. Um, but definitely my backup plan was, if I did get it rejected, was to reach out for, and ask you to help me because as my friend and as also the one who, go, who told me about it, <laughs> um, you were my best bet and you were my plan. Yeah. And for me, I thought, all I'm going to lose is the 400 pounds. I paid for this application. And if it's rejected, it's fine. I don't want to go through more without really being sure the second time around. Yeah. And so, yeah, definitely. It would, have, it would have reduced my stress levels by half, if not more. Yeah, I agree. Like I've, 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 luckily, I was accepted the first time around, but that didn't stop the stress. And you are right. Every stage of the process, every decision you have to make is a stressful one. Um, and this is why I help people now because I'm, I'm, the, I'm the third person that sits out at the outside and go, okay, just take a grip. Okay, let's have a look at what you've got. Don't stress. Let's look at your application in, in its entirety and we'll work through it. And it's really nice to have that second, yeah. second eye. And that's what I provide to my clients. And, and yeah, and sometimes I do have to slap them sometimes. So <laughs> don't stress, it's fine. Yeah. Um, I think we all underestimate support. Yeah. Support is important. It makes it so much easier. Yeah, so definitely support. Okay, so we are a little bit over and I'm really sorry, but um, I just wanted to say thank you, Hadil, and congratulations. Um, everyone, I will get back to you, but if not, please email me. Um, you've got my email address. If not, it's techvisa at michellehewer.co.uk um, and I can answer your questions. But um, thank you so much for your time, Hadil. It's so thank great. You. And I'm so happy to see you on this side. <laughs> but I do want to say you are exceptionally talented before you apply for this visa. You know, it, you're the same person. I know that little bit of paper does confirm it and, you know, means that you have a future in the UK, but you still are an exceptionally talented person. You're doing amazing things with Bright Sign Glove and um, I look forward to, you know, continuing our relationship and, yes. you know, yeah. So, and good luck in London. I know you're in the office today and um, stay safe and stay well. And everyone, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it was really, really happy. I'm really glad to do these webinars just to help you um, along your journey because you know we've been through this process. Support is key, and um, I'll be in touch with all of you soon. But again, thank you so much, guys. I'm going to leave it here. Bye.